Hey there, welcome to another episode of The Cutting Room Floor. This is a segment that we get to delve into some content or some material from a recent message here at Sunny Slope that maybe we just didn't get time to explore fully in a sermon. And so this little segment gives us the opportunity to to do that, to go uh, into some more detail on a topic that maybe is part of a message, but um, but we just don't have time to get to it in a, in a message. So today I want to look at a question that I think a lot of people have, um, and it's even it's often even framed as an objection to Christianity. It's often given as a reason that people have difficulty with Christianity. And that objection or that reason is that uh, the cross and, and even the gospel itself is really a morally objectionable because what you have is you have a father inflicting what amounts to divine child abuse on his son for something he didn't do, right? So you have Jesus on the cross and the father is inflicting this horrible suffering on Jesus and Jesus is innocent and he doesn't deserve it. And so how can you believe in a God who would inflict that kind of suffering on his own undeserving son in like, because, you know, in our context today, we would look at something like that and it would amount to child abuse. So how can you believe in a God where the, how can you, how can you embrace a religion where that is, that's, that's in fact predicated on or built on this idea of the father inflicting suffering on his son? And so I want to. I, I think that's a good question to ask. I think it's a worthwhile question to ask. I want to. Um, I want to just kind of explore this a little bit first by maybe looking at the underpinning, the underlying idea behind this is that, uh, and and what a lot of people find difficult to accept and to believe about God, is that God is this angry, vindictive, vengeful God who is just lashing out in in anger. And so in the objection that people have, you have a father who is sort of akin to the father who comes home from work and he's just temperamental and he's just lashing out at whoever happens to be closest to him. And so the idea of of seeing God in that way is uh, is is very difficult, obviously. Um, we don't particularly like the idea to think about God as an angry God. We judge anger to be a negative emotion and a distasteful um, sort of characteristic. And when you think about abusive parents, of course, it's a horrific thing because abusive parents, abusive parents don't just punish their children. They uh, they are reacting out of anger, they're re- reacting and lashing out, and they're inflicting harm on the very people that they're supposed to love and care for and protect. And in that case, abused children are, they're helpless. They're not able to stand up for themselves. They're not able to defend themselves against the um, the, the anger of their parent. And so, um, so we sort of lump all of that together and we assume that anger is a negative emotion, that anger is is distasteful and that the child, you know, is uh, in, an, in the case of an abusive parent, they're not able to defend their themselves against that parent. And so this idea of the crucifixion and God punishing his own son for something the son didn't do um, becomes a very difficult uh, idea. I want to, um, so so I'm going to, I'm going to try to show why that's not what's happening at the cross. I'm going to try to show in a minute that the cross is not about God just temperamentally lashing out at an undeserving and, um, um, you know, helpless victim. But I, I, I also want to maybe poke a little bit at the idea of God. When we think about God as being an angry and vindictive God, and we judge that negatively, um, I think it's worth asking where did where did the idea of that being a negative thing come from? Now, again, we're going to look in a minute why viewing God as a sort of temperamental God is obviously not a good thing, but the idea of God being angry <clears throat> is it's it's really I think comparatively recently that this became viewed in a 
in a negative light. In other words, it's only been within the last maybe 100, 150, 200 years, maybe a little bit longer. It's only in that recent time span that 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 we could no longer assume that God is an angry God. In other words, prior to that, everybody would take for granted and would just naturally accept the idea that God is a God of anger or that anger is a, is a part of God's character. Um, up until probably the 17, 1800s, people would not really have much difficulty with that idea. It's only within the last 250 years that people began, I think, to really question the idea of God's anger. And it's maybe worth just asking the question, what changed? And I would suggest that's probably too big of a question to really fully get at in a video like this. This is meant to be sort of a shorter video. But but I raise that question because I think it was in about that time. It was about the 17th, late 18th century or so. And culture begins to change, or late 18th century, maybe early 19th century. Culture begins to change. And sort of during the romantic period of history, all of a sudden we elevate the, you know, we elevate sort of the feelings, the emotions of human existence. The human emotion becomes uh, the most important quality and and positive emotions are paramount. And so anything, you know, to do with God, God, it's very easy to accept the idea of God of love and compassion and forgiveness and grace. But Culture changed in such a way that the idea of God being a God of justice and anger became uh, much more difficult to accept. And um, and and I think, you know, and so you come up with ideas, you hear these ideas and these concepts like, well, the God of the Old Testament is a God of judgment and a God of wrath, and in the New Testament, God is a God of, you know, grace and forgiveness. And of course, that's not at all consistent with the biblical message. The God of the Old Testament is actually pointed to as gracious and compassionate, as well as a God who brings judgment. And the God of the New Testament, Jesus talks about judgment probably more than any other Old Testament prophet. And so uh, the idea of of God, you know, sort of splicing God in two like that and, and separating him out just doesn't fit the biblical picture. But I also want to maybe point out and, and try to make the case that actually we are better off with a God who is a God of, of righteous anger. And why the idea of God as a God of judgment is, in fact, a good thing. When you consider the injustices present in our world today, um, there's no shortage of things that are really horrific and hard to stomach. So depending on the numbers, for example, there are anywhere between 25 and 30 million people that are caught up in sex trafficking. Um, some of that's um, child sex, you know, the child sex trade, some of it's pornography, the pornography industry, and so on. So there are 25, anywhere between 25 and 30 million victims of sex trafficking. Consider something like war crimes, places in parts of the world that we, that aren't even really on our radar, where soldiers come in and they rape women and children um, as they're conquering uh, a particular territory. Consider the atrocities of history. Consider the Holocaust. Uh, consider the Holomador, Holomador in Ukraine during the, the 19, uh, 1920s and 30s, where more, more Ukrainian people were killed than uh, far more people were killed than even in the Holocaust. Consider ethnic cleansing. Consider wars, unjust wars. Um, just to name a few, consider racism that is still prevalent in our world today in just about every part of the world, every place that you go, you will find examples of that. So so when you consider all of these evils and all of these injustices, um, the question is, what do we what do we do with that? Or maybe to frame it a little bit differently, what hope is there for the victims of such injustice? And what hope is there for the victims of such violence? If you do away with the idea of God's wrath, then you are forced to accept a couple of possible outcomes. Number one, if you do away with God altogether, then you're forced to accept a world that um, in which evil seems to get away with an awful lot. And you're forced to accept a world where really the strong uh, will triumph over the weak and the more powerful will always uh, conquer the weak and the helpless. And there's never recourse uh, 
for the victims of such injustice and such violence. Now, if you keep God in the picture, but you just make God a loving God, then you're forced to accept a very helpless witness to evil. See, God just becomes a passive eyewitness who's really not in a position to do anything about the injustices suffered by victims of such evil. And so consider, inst- and, and I think neither of those is, is, is a very um, palatable or very attractive alternative. Right? How do you how do you come to grips with the world? I mean that that becomes a very nihilistic, um, you know, sort of world in which injustice will win the day in many cases. So consider something instead. Consider an alternative. Consider that um, that God is angry, and it's not in spite of the fact that He's loving, but precisely because He is a loving God. Right? The Christian gospel presents God as a God who is a god of anger but it's it's precisely because he has created the world to be a place of wholeness and flourishing and peace and a place in which human beings are living in perfect relationship with one another and with god and so uh when you see the way that world has been so defaced and so vandalized by the power and the presence of sin, then number one, it makes sense that God would be angry, but but keep in mind that God's anger is rooted in injustice. But it also makes sense then that God's anger is a response. It, it's, a, it's a committed response to the problem of evil in this world. And, and so when we talk about God's judgment, it's it's not a temperamental God lashing out in anger. It's really a God who is committed to making right the wrongs that are in this world. And that's what brings us, of course, to the cross. And that's what brings us then to the question, well, why does God just pour out his anger on Jesus? And 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 why does God get away with what amounts to divine child abuse? The response to that is to point out and to remember that Jesus is not a helpless victim in in the cross. Jesus is not um, bragged against his will to the cross. In fact, Jesus repeatedly says in the Gospels, he says things like, "Um, I am am not doing, I have not come to do my will, but yours. He's speaking then to God. That's in Mark chapter, um, chapter 14. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and this is what we looked at recently here at Sunny Slope. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and what he says is, Father, if there may be any other way uh, then then let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. And so even as he's, he's sort of pleading with the Father for an alternative, he's also surrendering and submitting himself fully and completely to the will of his Father. So he is going willingly down this road of suffering. He says things like, "I my life is mine and I lay it down and I take it up again. And so there again, you hear Jesus not being forced against his will, but willingly laying down his life um, for the sake of another. Um, it's it's maybe not the best analogy, the best example, but you know, during the course of war, there are many governments that will send soldiers into places where they know that there's a good chance that they will be attacked and injured and even killed. But it cannot be said that the state is inflicting harm on these soldiers because the soldiers are doing so willingly and there's something it's it's not an exact parallel maybe but it gives you a sense into this uh in, in into how this works jesus willingly goes to the cross and he willingly experiences and endures the wrath of god on the cross it's also good to remember that jesus that the father and the son while they are distinct our understanding of the trinity is that they are uh, they're distinct, but they are not separate. And so the father is not inflicting harm on his son without experiencing that pain and anguish in himself. There's there's a sense in which we remember that the father and the son are one. And so even as Jesus is on the cross, it's you, you, there's there's a sense in which the 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 judge and the condemned are there at the same time. The father, who is passing the sentence is also the, is is passing sentence on his son, and the son is also experiencing that. But the father and the son are one, and so there's this uh, there's a sense in which 
God himself is not separated from his from his wrath and his judgment. So Jesus in 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 the work of the cross Jesus is not an innocent victim. He is not a, a being trafficked against his will uh in uh child abuse in the case of child abuse. He's willingly laying down his life for the good of another. Well thanks for watching. Um we'll see you again next time on the cutting room floor.